In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, we are going to be continuing our little excursion through the book of 1 Samuel. And you may recall that up until this point, what we have been looking at is Saul and his coronation and his basically public announcement that he's going to be king. Well, all of that has transpired now. All of that happened in the previous chapter, in chapter 10. And so it is well known and it is well accepted by everyone in Israel, even if there are some scoffers and naysayers. Everybody pretty much acknowledges at this point that Saul is indeed the king of Israel and the rightful king of Israel. And so... They're all sort of looking to him. But then something happens. And this is really Saul's first test as a leader. This is the first time that he's had to actually exercise any of his responsibilities as a king in Israel. And it happens with a, a region there in Israel that has been beset by an evil tyrant named Nahash. Now, Nahash is the ruler. I don't know if he's technically a king or not, or at least not in the way that we would think of it, but he's, he's the leader of the Ammonites. And he's apparently a pretty spooky dude, because as the chief of the Amorites, he enters negotiations with these people that live near him in Israel, in this region of Israel, and they, they go and talk to him, and they want to negotiate, and they say, you know what, basically, we already believe that you're going to beat us, we're not even going to fight for our freedom, we'll just go ahead and be your slaves if you promise not to kill us. Apparently, this guy was so terrifying that the Israelites just go to him and offer themselves and say, we'll be your servants if you just don't kill us. That's how sure they were that they were going to lose. That's how certain they were that it would be better to, to go ahead and to surrender now to prevent the slaughter of them. And we don't know if there had been hostilities beforehand. It's reasonable to assume that that has taken place. There's probably already been at least a battle or two, or if nothing else, a few small skirmishes between their troops and the men of Israel. And remember, there was no single commander of Israel's military at this time. You do have a military leader back in the days of Joshua. You do have certain people like the judges in the form of Gideon that are leading armies. But by and large, I mean, Israel's military is kind of run like a militia at this point. And they're so certain of their defeat that they just go ahead and offer themselves up to the Ammonites. And the solution to this, the condition for the surrender given by Nahash is, okay, those are acceptable terms if everyone among you will gouge out their right eye. And what's really horrifying is that the children of Israel say, you know what, we'll think about it. And they go back and consult with their ed elders and the people that are running their country saying, uh, sh should we go ahead and do this? Think about that. These people are so terrified of the Ammonites. They are so scared of this guy that not only are they willing to go ahead and surrender their freedom and not even want to fight anymore, that they say that when his condition is, you have to gouge out your right eye and then I'll believe that you're sincere, they're like, maybe, maybe we should do it. Like, we don't want to do it, but maybe we should go ahead and do this because of how scary this guy is and, and maybe gouging out our eyes and our children's eyes and our loved one's eyes, maybe that's at least better than all of us dying. I mean, this had to be a pretty terrifying group of people if that is what they were contemplating doing. And so because this crisis has come about, now we're going to see Saul's reaction to that in 1 Samuel 11, verses 5 through 7, which states, Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and he said, What is this matter that the people that they weep? So they related to him the words of the men of Jabesh, Jabesh, of course, the region that is being beset by this guy. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily, and when he heard these words, and he became very angry. But certain... Uh-oh. Sorry about that. That's the, uh, the wrong passage. 
Uh, maybe I put it in the wrong spot here. Well, I apologize for that. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and give you the second part of that verse. Uh, this is verse 7 in that same passage. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them through the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to, this, to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell on the people that they came out as one man. A couple of really interesting things about this passage that I noticed going through it is I think, first of all, before we even get into the meat of what this passage is saying, I want to make sort of a tangential point here that did you notice that when this trouble is brewing, that where Saul comes from is behind the oxen and he comes out of a field? What does that imply? What the verse is actually saying there is Saul heard that there was some kind of commotion going on while he was plowing. So in other words, Saul, the king of this nation, is out there plowing his fields behind his oxen just like everybody else. Just like the farmers and, and ranchers and people that he was ruling over, Saul was out there tilling the soil just like them. I find that really a testament to the kind of person that Saul is. Now, of course, we all know that that level of humility and that heart for God, unfortunately, that all kind of goes away later on in his story. But right here, right now, early King Saul, I mean, King Saul is a people's man. He, he is a man of the people in every sense of the word. He's just out there doing his, his farm work just like everybody else in the kingdom. And I think that really speaks to the kind of unassuming character that Saul has early on in his career as king. And getting back to the main point here, I love that the way that the Bible characterizes Saul's reaction is that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him when he heard this, and he became angry. So you see that's a cause and effect statement, that the Spirit of the Lord came on Saul, and he became very angry. Now, would Saul have become angry without the Spirit of the Lord coming on him? I don't know, maybe, but the scripture does make it very clear that the reason he becomes very angry, the reason that he is wroth at hearing this news, is because the Spirit of God came on him in a very powerful way. Now, that's really interesting to me, because especially with our 21st century lenses, we tend to always think of God in terms of, of love and compassion and mercy, and all of those things are true of God, don't get me wrong. But this really should come as a surprise to nobody. I mean, have, have you read the Old Testament? Have you read parts of the New Testament? God getting angry is not an altogether uncommon event. He is long-suffering, he's patient, he's merciful, but it is not beyond God to get angry at people and go after them when they have deserved it, when they have earned it, when they have done something to earn his wrath, he delves it out. He's going to wait a long time. He's going to give them an opportunity to repent. But at some point, God's anger is going to be on display. And when it does, buddy, look out. And that's exactly what's going on here. The Spirit of God, the mantle of God is coming upon Saul. And the reaction by Saul, which is appropriate, is he's just as angry as God would be at hearing this news. Now, of course, we know God already knew this. And maybe that's part of the reason that his spirit coming on him had this effect on him. But when this happens, Saul becomes very angry. In other words, the Bible is attributing this anger as a godlike quality. Isn't that interesting? That Saul as a man is able to enhance himself and, and be made more like God by becoming very angry at this news. So a couple things that I, I wanted to really zo zoom in on, because the Bible has a lot to say about controlling your anger. It does. I mean, you look at, for example, the book of James is a great example. You look at some of the times where people got angry and, and God was very harsh with them for being angry. So what's the difference here? And if you're looking at this passage, the difference seems to be where that anger is pointing to and what is the source of that anger. Because there are several examples in the Bible of people getting angry where they shouldn't have and, and several examples of people getting angry where it's justified. Christ gets angry many times with the Pharisees, with the, the Romans, 
uh, he gets angry with different people in the scripture all the time. And it seems as though the common thread throughout all of that is the thing that he was angry at was evil. He wasn't angry at personal slights. I mean, the man was literally murdered on a cross for crimes he didn't commit, and we never see him get angry there. Where does he get angry? When people are taking advantage of other people in the temple. Multiple times. Where does he get angry? When the Pharisees are playing religious games and trying to, to make people feel as though that they're not religiously pure, or they're not doing the right thing, they're not living the life that God wants for them to live when they take one too many steps on the Sabbath day. That's where Christ gets angry. And we see in the Old Testament that there are times where David gets angry, where uh, multiple characters that wind up going out to war even and engage in violence are angry at something that has happened. When is that anger justified? The common thread through all of them is that they're angry at evil, not angry at a personal offense against them, not angry because of something silly or foolish or because someone has impugned my reputation or my honor. No, the time that anger is okay and actually personified right here in this verse is when some kind of evil has come about. Because you think about what Nahash has done here. This is one sadistic dude. That he has these people so under his thumb and so terrified of him that he's like, you know what, torture yourselves. And once you've done that, I'll believe that you're sincere and then you'll get the privilege of being my slaves as opposed to me just outright slaughtering all of you. I mean, that's an evil, evil dude. We don't hear about him much because he's taken care of very quickly and he's not a character that's in lots of passages of scripture or somebody that afflicts Israel over a long period of time. But you look through some of the biblical villains, Nahash is about as bad as it gets. You'd have to rank, of course, Satan ahead of him and then maybe Pharaoh and a couple of others. But as far as just being an evil, twisted individual, Nahash, what he's suggesting here, that, that's pretty rough. And the second that Saul hears about this, he's like, uh, no, you don't, not to God's children, not to his chosen people. This is not something that we're going to tolerate. And in his gray anger, he cuts apart his own oxen and sends it to the other people and says, hey, if you are not courageous enough, if you are not willing to join this fight, then you're going to have the same thing done to your oxen. Man, I mean, that's an encouragement there. Because everybody else is so terrified of fighting that it is so scared to even stand against this guy that they're thinking maybe it would be better for us to just gouge out our own eye and gouge out the eyes of our own family and children, and that would be a better course than fighting to keep ourselves from his slavery and tyranny. And Saul says, uh, no, in fact, if you are not willing to stand against this individual, then you are going to be punished for it. And so what happens here is that it turns out, weirdly enough, that anger got the job done. Anger at these people being abused, anger at these people being taken advantage of, anger at the lack of faith in God that he was going to protect them and he would be with them if they chose to stand against Nahash. And anger gets the job done because it says in verse 7 there that they all came out as one man. In other words, they came out in a united front as one people, as one mind. They said, you know what? Saul's got a point. This is not right. It's not fair. This is not something we should do. And we should have faith that God is going to be with us and take care of us. And that if we go out to fight, then we are going to be okay. It doesn't matter how big and scary this guy is. He's not bigger and scarier than God. And so even though we usually think of anger as a negative thing, this is a time where anger, righteous anger at a legitimate injustice and evil of other people being oppressed, it bubbles up and it becomes the solution. It encourages people that when Saul gets angry, they start thinking about it. It's like, yeah, th this isn't right. Why are we taking this course of action? And so it wasn't just that they all got together because they were scared of losing their oxen. The way that the Bible describes it is the hearts of the people have changed. They came out in a unified front. It wasn't just that they were conscripted or felt obligated to do this. No, the indication of the scripture is that Saul's angry response to this that comes from him by God 
is something that actually changed the hearts of men. That's impressive. And I think that it also helps remind us that even though we should be slow to anger, just like God's slow to anger, that we should always reserve it for only the most extreme of circumstances, there are times where evil is being done that it is time for God's people to rise up and speak out against it, and doing so will help change the heart of the people, that it will draw the other chosen, the other elect, the other members of the body of Christ to us and rally support. That's something that happened here in the Old Testament with the children of Israel. It can happen today just as easily. And so there are times where being angry at evil is actually the godly thing to do because God is furious whenever he is confronted with evil. Anger can awaken that sleeping courage in others and sort of shake them awake to the injustices of the world. This is part of the reason that, that Christ acts out in a very open way when it comes to the evil that was being done in the temple. He, there's a reason for that. He saw an injustice, and he saw that there were other people that just weren't seeing the injustice, that weren't taking notice of it, and he sort of jars them awake with this display. And so this is something that, whether you're talking Old or New Testament, is something that is actually biblically recommended. Ultimately, if we are to be imitators of God, if we're supposed to be like Him in every respect, if we're going to constantly try to reevaluate ourselves and restructure our lives based on that evaluation to be as similar to God as possible, we have to be outraged at evil. In fact, if we're apathetic towards evil or we see evil and we're just kind of like, ah, whatever, somebody else will deal with it, then we're doing the opposite. We are rebelling against God. We are not acting like He and Jesus Christ taught us to act. And so I don't think that we need to be angry all the time. I don't think that we need to be flying off the handle at every little thing that happens. But I am seeing right here in the scripture a perfect example of how imitating God sometimes means seeing evil and taking action to stop it. Being angry enough to say, no, this is not going to happen, not on my watch. That's what happened to Saul, and that's a calling that we have too. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, Woke Brigade.